We're looking today at this concept from Exodus chapter 19, and if you'd like to turn there, we will read a couple of verses there. But this concept, that God is the God of all the earth, that every nation belongs to him, not just Israel, and he loves everybody in the world, not just Israel. But we looked previously in Exodus 19 at these verses in connection with the idea that God's people are a kingdom of priests. Still, the point remains that all the earth in Exodus 19 refers to the people of earth. <clears throat> so we have in Exodus 19, verses 4 through 6, that God calls to the children of Israel when they are at the foot of Mount Sinai, when they, they have just come out of Egypt, crossing the Red Sea, all those things that are recorded, and they're now awaiting the law of God to come to them from Mount Sinai by the hands of Moses. But before that happens, God sends this message to them. In Exodus 19, verses 4 through 6, You've seen what I did to the Egyptians, how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now therefore, if you'll indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you will be a special treasure to me above all people. For all the earth is mine, and you will be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. He said, you'll be a special treasure, a treasured possession among all peoples. Well, peoples is not plural for people. It's, it's uh, nations. <laughs> we mean countries, nations, uh, you know, tribes, races, however you want to describe that. He says, Israel will be a treasured possession among all the nations. But the purpose of that, as he says, is, but all the earth is mine. So though, though Israel is a treasured possession, it's true, they have a special place among the nations. At that time, they did. Nonetheless, the end of that, the point of that, is that the entire earth, all the nations, all the peoples, belong to God. Israel's special place among these peoples is to be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. So when he says to them, you're my possession, you're my possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine, he's not talking about the environment. He's not talking about the animals. He's talking about the people. He cares for every soul of humankind. And this is the meaning, which is very consistent in Psalm 24, where I draw your attention, and uh, we'll be back to Psalm 24 later on here. But for now, we just want the first couple of verses. It starts with, the earth is the Lord's, and all its fullness this is very similar to what you read in Exodus 19, verse 5. All the earth is mine. The earth belongs to, to me, said God to his children. In Psalm 24, the earth is the Lord's. Very similar, of course. And the fullness of it. What is the fullness of it? The world and those who dwell therein. When we say the earth belongs to God, we mean the people of earth belong to God. This refers to the people who dwell on earth, just as Exodus 19 had. This one, I would say, even more obviously, more you know, directly as the way that it's worded. The earth belongs to, the God, to God, the fullness of it, the world and those who dwell in it. Very clear. We mean the people. Every soul of humankind belongs to God. So that's the first thing we should say, is that God is concerned for people. He's concerned for human souls. Not that he has no concern for our environment or the animals, but just to say this is the focus for us. This is what we can do something about. 
He loves people. He loves the people of the earth. That's the thing. That's the focus. So now we'll go over to 1 Corinthians 10. You can be turning there while we ponder this next question. We've established that all the earth belongs to God and that all the earth refers to the people of earth. But in 1 Corinthians 10, in your New Testament, the Apostle Paul refers back to Psalm 24 that we just began to read there. The Apostle refers back to that. We know that the psalm, as we read it, presented itself rather clearly as being about the people of the earth, the people who dwell in all the world, that this belongs to God. And that's very consistent with Exodus 19.5. But when Paul uses it in 1 Corinthians 10, he's using it to explain clean and unclean foods. The law of Moses has a lot of regulations about what is clean and unclean in many realms, but in this case, we're talking about foods. What kinds of animals are allowed to be eaten and what are not allowed to be eaten? These things are clearly delineated in the law. And it's what Paul is addressing when he quotes Psalm 24. So the question is, what's the connection? When Psalm 24 is clearly talking about People, all the people of the earth belong to God. How can Paul use it in connection with foods, clean and unclean? You know, kosher eating, if you like that. That's the question. And yes, that's clearly what Paul's doing at 1 Corinthians 10. It's verse 25 and 26. He writes these people who live in... Corinth, you know, a Greek city-state, they certainly are big on many different animals that are expressly forbidden in the law, most notably pork. And he says to the Christians at Corinth, eat whatever sold in the meat market, asking no questions for conscience's sake, for the earth is the Lord's in all its fullness. Just eat whatever is sold in the meat market. Well, what is sold in the meat market at Corinth? Well, all kinds of things. Some of them are considered clean in the law of Moses, and some of them are not. There's lots of unkosher meat there. But Paul said, go ahead and eat it, because, or for, verse 26, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. It's a direct quote from Psalm 24 and verse 1. So very clearly saying to them, Corinth, you can eat whatever is being sold, it's clean in and of itself. Now, they do have some things they talk about with regard to if somebody wants you to be signing off on their idolatrous practices by eating this food for them. Well, then, no, you refuse to do that, not because that God is real or because that meat is somehow mystically changed or whatever, but just for the sake of the person who told you, you don't want to give any credence to their false god. They have these kinds of discussions. But this here is rather plain, that whatever is being sold can be eaten because the entirety of earth belongs to God. But that's people. 1 Corinthians 10 is clearly about food in the marketplace at Corinth. Psalm 24 is clearly about people. And what I'm telling you is that Paul isn't wrong. <laughs> when he quotes this, he's not taking Psalm 24 out of context. He doesn't fail to grasp what Psalm 24 is about. That's not what's happening here. That's the way a lot of people interpret Scripture. They assume that it's wrong or that the people who wrote it don't know what they're talking about. Of course, the people who assume those things seem to always think that they know what they're talking about, oddly enough. But no, uh, Paul has not made a mistake here. He understands what Psalm 24 is about, and he understands 
why he is using that as his rationale for explaining this. What is he saying? The question is, do we understand what he's saying, right? <laughs> uh, Paul is not on trial. We are on trial. Do we understand what he is saying? Well, it's Acts chapter 10. It's Acts chapter 10, my friends. This is where these things come together. This is what these things mean. In Acts 10, Paul tells, I'm sorry, God tells Peter, what God has made clean, do not call common. Common was their word for unkosher. Um, you know, common as in profane as opposed to holy. Common rather than holy. Clean and unclean, or kosher and unkosher, right? But what God has made clean, do not call common. It's what the Lord told Peter. The connection between foods and people becomes clear in Acts chapter 10. This is the place where Peter goes to a Roman house, a Roman centurion. <coughs> it's the first time the gospel is taken to somebody who is not a Jew, but a citizen, you know, a, a, a national of another nation, not Israel, in this case, Rome, very clearly Roman. You don't, you know, you don't get a more Roman name than Cornelius. Um, yeah. This is where it comes from, and it is actually the main idea, although I, for many years, have missed it and not understood it. So I wanted to bring it forward for everybody else. You may have gotten there before I did, but, you know, I have to do the talking. So you have to follow me <laughs> and my lack of understanding. But in Acts 10, the first thing that we read about, and I've got verses 1, 3, and 5 here, for our quotations, but the first part of this, it's revealed to us in Scripture that God speaks to a Roman. A certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the Italian regiment. That's the Roman cohort belonging to, you know, that's what he belongs to, his centurion order, if you will. A devout man, one who feared God with his household, who gave alms generously to the people, that is the Judeans, the Jews, and prayed to God always. About the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God coming in and saying to him, Cornelius, on observing him, he was afraid and said, what is it, Lord? He said, your prayers and alms have come up for a memorial before God. Now send men to Joppa and send for Simeon or Simon whose surname is Peter. So God speaks directly to this Roman. You can't get any more Roman than Cornelius is. And he's got a vision telling him to go fetch this individual, Simon Peter. You and I know who Simon Peter is because of our familiarity with the Scripture hitherto, if you've read these things before. But he has no idea. In the meantime, Simon, Peter, when he is staying at Joppa, we are told in the ninth verse, went on the housetop to pray, became very hungry, wanted to eat, but while they were making ready, he fell into a trance. And the eleventh verse captures, he saw heaven opened and an object like a great sheet bound at the four corners descending to him and let down to the earth. In it were all kinds of four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, birds of the air. And a voice came to him, rise, Peter, kill and eat. All kinds of animals, Four-footed animals, wild beasts, creeping things, birds of the air. These are reptiles and bugs, things that are clearly forbidden. In addition to all kinds of animals, there are others, you know, 
four-footed creatures they are not allowed to eat. Many things that are forbidden in the law of Moses directly. And this has been let down to him from heaven on a table prepared by God, right? The sheet, the tablecloth opens and it's full of these things. And he says to him, God says to him, rise, Peter, kill and eat. So he's been told to eat everything, including things that he knows in the law of Moses were not allowed. To which Peter retorts in the 14th through the 17th verses, Not so, Lord. I've never eaten anything common or unclean. As we said, common as, a, as opposed to holy. You know, unclean as opposed to clean. And the voice spoke to him a second time. What God has cleansed, you must not call common. These are the words that he himself used. He said, I've never eaten anything unclean. And God said, God has made it clean. I've never eaten anything common. He said, you must not call it common. It's not common anymore. Well, the vision at first appears to be about kosher eating, doesn't it? It appears to be about clean and unclean foods. This was done three times and the object was taken up into heaven again, and Peter wondered within himself what the vision which he'd seen meant. But it's at that moment that the men who had been sent from Cornelius had made inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate. <laughs> so they've come for him. Now there's Romans asking for Peter. Peter who until now has been accustomed to having nothing to do with Romans. But the 19th verse said, While Peter thought about the vision, the Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are seeking you. Arise, therefore, go down, go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. God is the one who arranged this meeting. Peter still is not sure what the vision means, which is okay. He's thinking about this. But he also doesn't know why he's going with these fellows, except that God told him to go. God said, I sent them. Well, okay, he's going. And they take him to the household of Cornelius the following day. He actually, the first thing that he does is take them into the house and treat them as his guests, which is a wonderful thing and probably a first for Romans. In the 28th verse, when Peter begins to address the household of Cornelius, he says to them these things, You know how unlawful it is for a Jewish man to keep company with or go to one of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call common or unclean any person. This is why I came without objection as soon as I was sent for. I asked then... For what reason have you sent me, <laughs> or sent for me? Yeah, he doesn't know why yet. But the important thing in the 28th and 29th verses of Acts 10 is this. As he said, God has shown me. I should call no person common or unclean. What's Peter realizing? He realizes that the vision is not about foods, it's about people. He was thinking of the people as unkosher and unclean, and there was a time when they were required to draw those distinctions. But God has cleansed it. God has made it so that they can come in. And so the commandment for Peter is, you shall not call them common or unclean. They're not unclean. They're not unkosher or profane. Mm -hmm. 
And the second time that he begins to address them is the 34th and 35th verses, just, just by themselves here. Peter opened his mouth and said, In truth I perceive that God shows no partiality, but in every nation whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. This is the revelation, you see. He came there and said, uh, pray, tell, why did you send for me? He doesn't know why. He knows that God sent him. And Cornelius, for his part and his family's part, well, they were told to call for Peter and that Peter would tell him some stuff at the 33rd verse. We're, we're here to, you know, we're all present. To, before God to hear all the things commanded you by God. Neither one of them knows what's about to be said because the Holy Spirit gives it to Peter in the moment, which is what Jesus said to the apostles. Don't prepare what you will say ahead of time. It will be given to you. And so he opens his mouth, and this is prophecy. In truth I perceive God shows no partiality but in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. These are the clean now, you see, in the sense that he's cleansed them, in the sense that he receives anyone in any nation who fears him. It isn't about what nation, right? Right? In other words, they, they used to, Peter, used to distinguish clean from unclean foods, and he used to distinguish clean from unclean birth. What country you're from? Now he knows that God shows no partiality. That is to say, it's, it isn't about who you are, as in who you're born to or where you came from. No, in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable. Yeah, they used to distinguish unclean, you know, clean and unclean food, clean and unclean birth. Now they distinguish clean and unclean actions without regard to their food or their birth. <coughs> the food and the birth are just foreshadows of this reality. The reality is that God is looking for anybody who fears him and does what is right without regard to what nation they come from or what foods enter the mouth. As Jesus said, it's not what enters the mouth that defiles or makes common. It's what leaves the mouth. That's true. And even John the Baptist said as much, remember, in Matthew 3, 9, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Yeah, it's not about what country you're from. All right, so I just want to make that very clear because it was never clear to me before, and, and uh, I've come to realize that this is what is actually happening. This is what the, this is what the passage is about. Who is clean? It's everyone in every nation who fears him and does what is right. And yes, it goes on to talk some about the life and teaching of Jesus. In the 43rd verse, Paul, uh, Peter said to him, all the prophets bear witness that through his name, whoever believes in him will receive remission of sins, which is very similar to what he said in Acts 2.38 and uh, prior. And so while he's speaking, God bears witness by granting that the Holy Spirit falls upon these as it fell upon uh, the apostles in Acts 2, which hasn't happened since that time. And Peter's response is captured in the 47th verse. Can anyone forbid water that these should not be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. 
which is exactly what happened in Acts 2.38. They are candidates, you see, to be baptized, to be forgiven in his name. They're baptized in his name. That's where forgiveness comes. It couldn't be clearer. And yes, as he said, who can forbid the water? Well, in point of fact, most modern American so-called churches forbid the water. Most of them tell you, you don't have to be baptized to be saved. In fact, many of them tell you that it's a work and that it's self-righteous and that if you do it, it's wrong. You shouldn't be acting like that. So this thing that never entered Peter's mind that anybody could do such a thing is exactly the mainstream American religion today. But if you're reading the Bible, you're not coming away with that. That's not a conclusion you draw from reading this passage or any other. That's a conclusion you have to be taught by twisting and error. Well, there was in Acts 10... 35, this statement. Let's talk about this new generation for a moment. There was in Acts 10, 35, that statement. Remember what he said, every nation, in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable. This is to say, all the earth is mine, Exodus 19, 5. Every nation is represented here. And back in Psalm 24, for the remainder of our consideration today, we're looking at the third through the sixth verses. Consider these things, see if it is not so. We said Paul is not on trial, we are on trial, and that is fine. You should try what I tell you and what I say. Nobody is above uh, sin, nobody is above making mistakes. I certainly am not above question. Put this to the test and see if it is not so. In Psalm 24, it's verses 3 through 6. After he said, The earth is the Lord's in all its fullness, the world and those who dwell in it. Then he says in verse 3, Who shall ascend or who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to an idol nor sworn deceitfully, he'll receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is Jacob, the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face. But again, you notice the third verse said, Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? Who stand in his holy place? Do you notice why he asks this question? It is about who. Is it Israel? Is that the answer? No. The answer is he who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to an idol nor sworn deceitfully, it doesn't say he who is born to the nation of Israel. You see the difference between those things? He who has clean hands and a pure heart has not lifted his soul to an idol nor sworn deceitfully. That's a lot more like Acts 10.35. It, it, he who fears God and does what is right. That's the person who's acceptable to him. Who may ascend the hill of the Lord, who may stand in the Lord's holy place. And yes, that, that is anyone who fears him and anyone who does what is right. The sixth verse, this is Jacob, the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face. Or such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek the face of the God of Jacob. Different ways of reading the same text, but they get to the same thing, don't they? Both of them are saying there is a generation you know, a generation, that's a race. 
a nation. What is the race? What is the nation? It is such. What such? Such as those who have clean hands and a pure heart, who have not lifted up their soul to an idol, who have not sworn deceitfully. Such is the generation of those who seek him. This generation is made up not of people generated in the normal fashion of human birth and human nations and human lineage, but people generated by faith. Their generation is the generation of those who seek him. They seek the face of the God of Jacob, one rendering says, which is fairly clear that many nations can seek the God of Jacob, the God of Israel. Or, in my New King James, we have, this is Jacob, the generation of those who seek him. That's a redefinition of Jacob. Jacob, not the generation of Abraham, the seed of Abraham. No, Jacob, the generation of those who seek him. Or, as Paul said in another place, he is not a Jew who is one outwardly. He is a Jew who is one inwardly, whose circumcision is of the heart. The generation of those who seek him, anyone who does what is right, Acts 10.35, right? This is the new generation. Those who are now Israel, those who are now Jacob, who are the seed of Abraham. And yes, in John chapter 4, when Jesus spoke with a woman at the well who was a Samaritan, not an Israelite, he said to her in John 4, 23, The hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship him. The Father is seeking such people to worship him, seeking what such people, such people as seek him. This is why, finally, in the Revelation, it's recorded in the 21st chapter about the city of God, the, that's the church that belongs to Christ. It's recorded there in the 26th and 27th verses. They will bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it. And there will by no means enter it anything that defiles or makes unclean, you see, or causes an abomination or a lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. This is what God means when he says, all the earth is mine. Anyone in any nation who fears God, anyone in any nation who does what is right, that is what God calls the glory and honor of the nations. People who will obey the gospel, souls who love the truth, who will put God first, come to him in humility and confessing that he is right. This is what comes into the church that belongs to Christ, the glory and the honor of the nations. It is the best, the people who love God, the people who fear him and will do what he wants. They're the ones who obey the gospel. They're the ones who do what P Peter said, are baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for forgiveness of sins. And no, there's not another way to be written in the Lamb's book of life. He said to Jesus, all the prophets testify that whoever believes in him receives forgiveness of sins in his name. That's why he commanded them to be baptized in his name. That's where you get forgiveness. There's not another way to have your name written in the Lamb's book of life. So nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false. Right. What God has cleansed, you must not call un unclean. It's not that way anymore. We now understand that God is looking for those who will worship him in spirit and in truth. That's what God esteems highly. 
even if perhaps man doesn't esteem it highly sometimes, God esteems it highly. And we ought to as well. Today, are you a Christian? Have you obeyed? Do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? Do you believe in the power of God to save everybody in every station of life? Well, he certainly can. You can be forgiven. You can start a new life. You know, tomorrow doesn't have to be like today. Things can be different in the Lord. The power of Jesus is to overcome sins. The power of, of Jesus in, in when you become a child of God is that you have a, a mediator, you have an advocate with God. Maybe now things are too hard to get over. And I think that, that might well be true. People are held captive to substances and patterns and habits of life and pressures of family and of culture and tradition, and these things are very difficult to deal with on your own. But what's going to work is to begin to obey God, become a Christian, because that puts Jesus in your corner. That, that puts an advocate on your side when you go to God in prayer. There's a strength there that is greater than your own strength to help you to overcome those things which you may not be able to do on your own. But he's looking for those that fear him and will do what is acceptable. And if that is your desire, you believe in God, you know you want to be his child, you want to please him, well, that's exactly what it takes. Repent and be buried in baptism with him, putting to death the old person for forgiveness and be resurrected in him, a child of God. And he'll help you to live right. He'll help you to overcome. And you can beat these things with his help. And you have brethren, too, when you obey the gospel. I mean, we're here. We're helpful. We've, we, some of us have been through some of the things that you've been through. We're here to help one another. Are you a Christian and have not lived right? Let us help you with our prayers to restore you back to the service of God. If you need our prayers or if you need to be baptized, please let your need be known by coming to the front while we stand and sing the song that has been selected.